So welcome everyone. It is so great to see so many people turning out for the Bacon and Deer Immigration Law and Policy Series. It's wonderful. Um, and we're glad to have UIC, um, a variety of students and some professors from other universities and I'm sure people from the community. So it's great. And uh, we're really honored to have Shoba here with us. Um, I wanna say there has been a disruption in, um, in a recent meeting at the law school. So we are prepared. We have uh, Julia Van Horn, who is a student moderator today and Carolee, who is our clinic administrator. And what, what we'll do if there's a disruption is just to suspend temporarily the action, get rid of the disruptor and then we'll resume. Um, and hopefully that won't happen. Um, we will have our speaker speak and then um, lots of time, I think, for discussion and question and answer. Um, Julia, did you wanna say something about the question and answer before I introduce Shoba? Sure, um, yes, we are going to be asking everyone to please hold their questions until after uh, the talk is over, but we will leave the chat open so that if you have something that you think of during the talk that you can go ahead and put it in the chat and then we'll address that at the end during the Q&A section. Yes, thank you. And thank you so much to Julia Van Horn for volunteering to moderate today. So I'm gonna introduce Shoba, Shoba Siva Prasad Wadia is an associate dean for, she is the associate dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion at uh, Penn State Law. And she's the Samuel Weiss faculty scholar and clinical professor of law. Her research focuses on the role of prosecutorial discretion in immigration law and the intersection of race, national security, and immigration. She has published two books. One is on the role of prosecutorial discretion in immigration cases, and one is on enforcement of immigration laws during the time of Trump. Um, she also co-authors one of the most widely used textbooks on immigration law in the country. She regularly publishes opinion pieces in major um, news publication and blogs, and she's co-authored briefs challenging the um, Muslim ban, the, the asylum ban, the travel ban, and other policies and rules impacting immigrants. Her work is sometimes cited by federal judges in important rulings on immigration cases. Um, Professor Wadia is also serving currently as the first editor in chief of the American Immigration Lawyers Association Law Journal. So at Penn State, she is teaching a course on immigration law and she teaches one on asylum and refugee law. And this is in addition to directing the Center for Immigrants Rights Clinic in which students do community outreach, legal support in individual cases, and policy work for institutional clients. The center is well known for high quality work that has a significant community impact, and it's received awards for excellence from the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee in 2017 and was named by the Pennsylvania Immigration Resource Center in 2019 as the legal organization of the year in that state. Uh, Professor Wadi has won many individual awards as well for her scholarship, for her teaching, and for her public service. One of the most recent awards was the Penn State Rosemary Schreer Mentoring Award. She also won the American Immigration Lawyers Association's Elmer Friend Excellence in Teaching Award. And she was recognized by Fast Case as one of the law's 50 Smartest, most courageous innovators, techies, visionaries, and leaders. Before joining Penn State, she served as a deputy director for legal affairs at the National Immigration Forum in Washington. And before that, she handled asylum, deportation, family, and immigration-based employment benefits matters as an associate for Maggio Qatar in Washington, DC. Um, some personal stuff, Professor Wadia comes from a musical family. She plays piano. Her daughter plays viola and her son plays cello. Um, I, I do want to add just 
some notes from my personal experience that um, as a colleague in the immigration field, I am especially grateful to you, Shoba, for, uh, for your leadership. She has really been um, leading the charge in the area of prosecutorial discretion from the time of President Obama with uh, important arguments that uh, really galvanized immigration law professors and then I was played an important part, I think, in the Obama administration's decision to widely exercise prosecutorial disc discretion, including for the Dreamers with DACA, um, uh, um, and has continued to lead the charge, you know, both in crime times of opportunity, as we're seeing now, and also in times of crisis, as we were seeing during the last administration. So. Um, we pile on us immigration professors and we also benefit tremendously from her up to date, uh, probably all, late at night, a crafting of, um, of these very de detailed um, fact sheets that are really uh, quickly accessible to us and to the public um, to keep us up to date on you know, the Muslim ban, on the DACA changes and all kinds of things. So I'm sure all the um, immigration professors watching will agree with me that these these she's really a great you know resource and leader in the field. So we're really grateful to you for your advocacy and leadership and um, for taking the time out of all this busy all your busy schedule to be with us today. Thank you, Shoba. Thank you. That was too generous. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, thanks to Professor Marcus for inviting me. It's nice to see familiar faces too. And I'm going to do my best to do justice to the big topic of racism in immigration law and policy. And like my fact sheets, I'm going to try and make it accessible, um, not knowing exactly um, who uh, is comprised uh, in this audience. And I want to talk about four things. Um, I'm going to spend the most time just on history and the history of exclusion because it's really an important prerequisite to understanding race in immigration law. I then want to talk about terminology and how we talk about immigration and immigrants, uh, followed by the intersection of race with immigration enforcement. I'll wrap up with where I think we should go from here, um, but I am not talking for an hour or even close to that. So I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments as well. So let's start with exclusion. The story of exclusion in immigration is so tied to race and traces back until the 19th century. Uh, Congress in 1882 passed the Chinese Exclusion Act um, perhaps you teach it, perhaps you read it in your immigration law class. This is an act that restricted Chinese immigration for 10 years and also made Chinese ineligible for naturalization. Some Chinese were able to remain in the United States if they obtained a certificate, but over time, even those who had certificates were excluded. Then in 1892, 10 years later, Congress extended the Chinese Exclusion Act for another 10 years and also presumed that any Chinese person was deportable um, unless they had proof that they were lawfully entitled to be in the United States. And under the new law, the punishments were severe, deportation, imprisonment, hard labor. The law also required that Chinese laborers who are already in the United States to register, obtain this certificate of registration, and they had to carry it with them everywhere. Um, and if they didn't have one, they had to explain why. And part of the process included at least one white credible witness. A failure to meet these requirements made the person deportable. I'm actually, side note, kind of studying this history for a larger project now because there was a huge civil disobedience movement with the Chinese who refused to register. In fact, most of them 
wouldn't register because they wanted to bring a case to court. Um, and there's a prosecutorial discretion story in it too, because the vast majority of people who were deportable were never deported. So the Supreme Court upheld these rules. And in doing so, they really surfaced the role of race in both the creation and perpetuation of exclusionary laws. The Chinese cases have never been overturned and really helped inform future exclusionary laws against groups based on race and nationality. The origins are actually more complex than just race, but race is a major strand. And the historian Andrew Gorey said this, quote, anti-Chinese racism served as a bridge from the antebellum era to the rise of Jim Crow into the 1880s when racism again became fashionable. The Chinese Exclusion Act by which Congress and the United States government legitimized racism as a national policy remains a legacy of the 19th century and its lingering impact of anti-Asian bigotry remains to this day." End quote. And that could really inform how immigration law and policy has played out since. So let's move in the historical timeline to 1917. Um, immigration was uh, significantly expanded, but so too were the exclusions. Over the veto of then President Woodrow Wilson, the 1917 Act included a literacy test. So anyone over the age of 16 had to show comprehension of any language. And the legislation also built on the Chinese Exclusion Act by banning immigrants from the zone lining from the Middle East to Southeast Asia. So protected from the 1917, excuse me, Act, were Japanese. One of the most significant immigration exclusions based on nationality and race occurred in 1924, when Congress created a national origins quota system. Specifically, the 1924 Immigration Act included a provision excluding from entry any alien, quote, who by virtue of race or nationality was ineligible for citizenship. Just as a practical matter, that included all individuals of Asian lineage. The bill was known as the Johnson Reed Act. It was signed by President Coolidge in 1924. And as described in a pretty recent book by Jia Lin Yang called One Mighty and Irresistible Tide, the implications of this act were pretty well understood by the bill's architects. One of those architects was Senator David Reed from my state of Pennsylvania, who wrote a New York Times essay that was titled, America of the Melting Pot Comes to End. In my opinion, no law passed by Congress within the last century compares with this one in its importance upon the future development of our nation. It will mean a more homogenous nation, end quote. It was only 40 years later, so not too long ago, in 1965, on the heels of the landmark Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act, when President Lyndon B. Johnson signed a bill into law to amend the immigration statute and dismantle the national origin quotas. Said President Kennedy, quote, we must lift by legislation the bar of discrimination against those who seek entry into our country, particularly those with much needed skills and those joining families. In establishing preferences, a nation that was built by the immigrants of all lands can ask those who now seek admission, what can you do for your country? But we should not be asking, in what country were you born, end quote. The 1965 Act is documented by scholars as watershed legislation. It's one that affected my own family. And despite this, it's complicated. Congress put in colorblind policies into the immigration law that to the present day impact the Latinx community. As described by immigration scholar Kevin Johnson, the act on the one hand contributed to a surge in legal immigration from Asia, which historically had been stunted by discriminatory laws, as well as the long distances from Asia to the United States. On the other hand, 
by placing an artificial ceiling on legal migration from Mexico, wholly disconnected from the great and increasingly unsatisfied demand for immigration, the legislation simultaneously spurred the growth of a large and expanding population of Mexican immigrants unauthorized by US immigration laws being in and subject to removal from the country, end quote. Congress was not the only body in the US government responsible for racial or exclusionary laws. After 9-11, some of you were around, some of you may have been toddlers, two agencies in the executive branch, the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Homeland, uh, Department of Justice, excuse me, played a significant role in creating policies that were explicitly racial or ones that had a dis disproportionate impact on Muslim, Arabs, and South Asians. On a personal level, I was on the ground as an immigration attorney responding to these policies, and they really informed my early work as an immigration attorney. In June 2002, former Attorney General John Ashcroft delivered remarks announcing a special registration program, also called the National Security Entry Exit Registration System. He said that this would be the program that would expand substantially America's scrutiny of foreign visitors. It was expanded to include people already living in the United States. And this expansion for those taking administrative law was published through notices in the Federal Register. And these notices only targeted men over the age of 16 from predominantly Muslim countries. There were 25 countries, and except for North Korea, every single country that was included were Muslim majority populations. And the mystery was plentiful. It included a lack of notice to people who had to go register, limited resources. Offices were really not equipped to handle these registrations. Um, Heavy-handed interrogations about how often do you pray and um, where, when's the last time you went to the Middle East? But it also expanded this premise that singling out Muslim men residing in the United States on valid visas would somehow improve national security. And we've never actually gotten out of this mold, right? If we look at policies prior and policies to follow. Numbers reported by the Department of Homeland Security show that nearly 14,000 of these men were given notices to appear and placed in deportation proceedings. So from 2003 to 2011, NSEERS continued and families continued to be affected. For example, maybe a student had no idea at the age of 16 that they had to register because they don't read the federal register with breakfast. Years later, they've married a US citizen, they're in a green card interview and they are denied their green card in the exercise of discretion because of a failure to register for a now obsolete program. I saw this happen over and over again. And this program was at once ineffective, costly, and discriminatory, said counterterrorism expert Juliet Kayyem. The pure accumulation of just massive amounts of data is not necessarily helpful because what this has become is an immigration sweep said the former INS commissioner, James Ziegler, what are we gonna get for all of this? The people who could be identified as terrorists were not gonna show up. The problem was, the program was a huge exercise and caused us to use resources in the field that could have been much better deployed. So how does the story end? The end of special registration is not very romantic or quotable. Um, but the regulatory framework giving rise to it was eventually killed. And I'm happy to talk about that backstory if it's interesting, but it was killed through the right combination of quiet and open advocacy and an administrative law tool called the final rule. Another exclusionary policy I wanna talk about, which is more familiar and more recent perhaps is the Muslim in Africa ban. 
And it was first issued as an executive order seven days after President Trump's inauguration on January 27, 2017. The order suspended for 90 days the entry of non-citizens from seven Muslim majority countries, Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. No matter how repetitive it gets, I always list the countries because people need to hear who and where from are affected. Another version of the Muslim ban was issued as a presidential proclamation on September 24th, 2017. It indefinitely blocked certain nationals from eight countries, Iran, Libya, Chad, North Korea, Syria, Somalia, Venezuela, and Yemen. These countries were ostensibly chosen based on perceived threats these countries posed. The proclamation was subject to legal actions. In October 2017, federal district courts in Hawaii and Maryland blocked the proclamation on statutory, constitutional, or both as in terms of the bases. And meanwhile, we had a series of appeals by the government, not just to the appellate court, which is sort of normal process, um, but also to the US Supreme Court before the appellate process had even been completed. And this is important for any person who believes in the rule of law to know, um, because this actually has more to do with federal courts and transparency um, than necessarily only race. We've seen a series of these sort of unsigned orders with no explanation issued by the Supreme Court that allows for policies to perpetuate even in the wake of a national injunction. And immigration has been one of the most touched topics around what is coined the shadow docket by Professor Boyd. And the Muslim ban was one of these cases. It's an almost forgotten story that the ban itself was operational in full months before the Supreme Court's decision, effective December 4th, 2017, because of the shadow docket. And it's counterintuitive to think that such a sweeping policy can go into effect without a ruling by the appellate court and without specific guidance. It was during this time that I was also working on a book project that Lynn mentioned um, called banned immigration enforcement in the time of Trump. And, you know, I was reflecting about the window during which I was conducting interviews for this book um, of individuals and families affected by the ban, of former government officials, as well as attorneys. Many of the stories I received were after the shadow docket orders, but before the Supreme Court ruling. So it's really telling the human consequences during that time period. Um, so one attorney I spoke to talked about the role of race and racism in her desire to fight the ban. She said to me, I thought you had to use every means at your disposable, disposal to make the world a better place. And that's where being Muslim or being perceived Muslim or being within that broad net felt personal enough that it was compelling for me to do the work in this way. An other attorney talked to me about an Iranian couple. They were both physicians and the uh, spou one spouse was pregnant, about to give birth to twins. And her mom was not able to travel to the United States because of the ban. She wasn't able to see the birth of her grandchild. She wasn't able to be here to help her adult children. And this is just a reminder about how the ban, not only in my opinion, threw a sledgehammer at our immigration statutes by leaving out people in legally qualifying relationships, um, but it also caused many people to miss the kinds of milestones we often share with families. Births of children, graduations, weddings, funerals, these are not just tourist visas for Disneyland, right? They're tourist visas for these very significant events that are often spent with families. Eventually, the proclamation was heard by the Supreme Court for full consideration, and the court decided that the proclamation itself was lawful. 
Um, in a brief that I filed as co-counsel, um, some of you signed on to it on behalf of immigration law scholars to the Supreme Court, we argued that by excluding people from entering the United States for no other reason than nationality and religion, the country was ushering us into a pre-1965 era in defiance of the immigration statute and legislative history leading up to the Immigration Act of 1965. So it's just a great reminder that even when we are in this time of history where the national origin quotas have been dismantled, we still have serious race and racism in immigration law and policy that needs a response. So the human impact, as I mentioned, is significant. This proclamation was also expanded in 2020 to include nationals from primarily African countries. Um, I was reflecting in a piece about just the resistance to this ban over the last four years. It's kind of tied to what we do, right? As a movement, what law lawyers and law students do too. Um, and it was on the heels of President Biden's announcement committing to ending the ban on day one. And I reflected as follows. Resistance to the ban was significant and revealed itself inside courts, on the streets, and at consulates. It arose also in the halls of Congress with the introduction of the No Ban Act, which if enacted would limit the exclusionary authority of the immigration statute and repeal the Muslim ban. The lawyering and advocacy exercised in the last four years to challenge the ban is an important part of our history. One I hope that our children and grandchildren read. It is a fight that evokes the words of Doris Lessing, who said, whatever you're meant to do, do it now. The conditions are always impossible. President Biden repealed the proclamation on January 20th, 2021, as one of his first acts as president. I now wanna move into some shorter conversation, first about terminology. We can't discuss racism and immigration law and policy without discussing the words used, both in law and in public discourse. The term alien appears in the immigration statute known as the Immigration and Nationality Act. It was crafted by Congress decades ago. At a recent press conference, Senator Menendez revealed a new immigration bill and noted that the word alien would be replaced by non Citizen. It was an emotional segment of the press conference, and it was significant because it was the first legal recognition and rejection of the term alien. And I want you now to just think about how expression is law, right? Here you have a proposal where an exclusionary term like alien is possibly being changed and writ written out of the law as we know it. For many years, like my colleagues on the call, I've avoided using the term alien except when quoting the statute or another source. And when I ask my students on the first day of immigration law, what do you think of when you hear the word alien or aliens, I'll often hear a response that is close to a person or an image from outer space or a person or object who doesn't belong. The term alien is not unrelated to terms like illegal immigrant, illegal immigration, illegal alien. Um, like alien, these terms are necessarily exclusionary and inconsistent with values of inclusion and equity in the country. Said the former New York Times writer Lawrence Downs about these terms, quote, since the word modifies not the crime, but the whole person, it goes too far. It spreads like a stain that cannot wash out. It leaves its target diminished as a human, a lifetime member of a presumptive criminal class. People are often surprised to learn that illegal immigrants have rights. Really? Constitutional rights? But aren't they illegal? Of course they have rights. They have the presumption of innocence and the civil liberties that the Constitution wisely bestows on all people, not just citizens, end point. Another term I want to talk about is war on terror. 
it's a term that generates a com conversation about who is and is not a terrorist. I know that after 9-11, I spent a lot of time trying to isolate immigration from terrorists or Muslims from the war on terror. We also saw this surface recently in the wake of the January 6th resurrection on Capitol Hill, where the event was labeled as domestic terrorism or a terrorist attack. But these terms can be problematic or at least are worthy of reflection because historically, they are the terms that have been used and created to target communities of color, and in particular, Muslims, Arabs, and South Asians. Throughout his presidency, former President Trump used some terminology of his own. He used words and phrases like calling Africans as individuals from asshole countries. He called Mexicans rapists and called for a total and complete shutdown of Muslim immigration. Press conferences by government leaders, and I remember this vividly from the press conference by Attorney General Sessions to end DACA, referred to dreamers as illegal aliens. The president's words surfaced in a powerful dissent by Justice Sonia Sotomayor in the Muslim ban case, another example of how words and the application of words can be law. And she said, the court's decision today leaves undisturbed a policy first openly and unequivocally advertised as a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Because the policy now masquerades behind a facade of national security concerns. But this repackaging does little to cleanse the presidential proclamation of the appearance of discrimination that the president's words have created. Based on evidence in the record, a reasonable observer would conclude that the proclamation was motivated by anti-Muslim animus, end quote. The efforts by the Biden administration to change the nomenclature is significant. It shows a profound shift in the narrative about how we talk about immigration, how we talk about immigrants. Um, and it's not just in the bill. It's also in some of the guidance documents that we've received from the Biden administration uh, since he took office. I now want to shift. There's a lot to talk about when we think about race and racism and immigration law and policy, but I want to talk about its intersectionality with immigration enforcement. I mean, we heard some of this already, right, when we heard about deportation and hard labor and imprisonment of Chinese and Chinese only, um, but it also intersects with modern immigration enforcement. Um, so just as a 101, immigration enforcement refers to any action that's taken by the Department of Homeland Security against a non-citizen who is alleged to have violated civil immigration law. And this might include arrest, detention, deportation, removal proceedings. The laws and policies that guide immigration enforcement today they're largely neutral, but the disproportionate impact on communities of color is well documented. The source for this impact can be traced to immigration laws passed in 1996 that increased the way a person can be charged, detained, and deported. Just as one example, Congress expanded the term aggravated felony to reach a wide range of conduct and in doing so, subjected a greater number of people to mandatory detention and deportation. As described by immigration scholar Cesar Garcia Hernandez in his recent book, Migrating to Prison, it hasn't always been this way. For most of US history, second chances were built into immigration law. Most of the time, crime was irrelevant to a person's ability to make a life here, end quote. Black immigrants are disproportionately affected by immigration enforcement. And this has been documented by Alina Das in her new book, No Justice in the Shadows, where she says, black people are more likely than any other group in the United States to be arrested, convicted, and imprisoned in the criminal enforcement system. 
Because of the intersection of immigration and criminal law, Black immigrants are more likely to encounter the criminal legal system and therefore more likely to encounter immigration enforcement. There are different ways that a non-citizen may enter the immigration system. Some may enter after serving time in the criminal justice system. The pipeline from criminal justice to immigration detention, criminal custody rather, it can be immediate, but it could also be over time. According to the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, Black immigrants make up 7.2% of the entire non-citizen population, but they are 20% of immigrants facing deportation for criminal reasons. Importantly, I, I, I don't want to overstate the role of criminality. We have to have that conversation. But the reality is that most deportations in this country are not because people have previous criminal convictions. Black and brown immigrants are also overrepresented in immigration detention, which today represents one of the largest forms of mass incarceration. The federal government has the discretion to detain or not an individual before, during, or after the removal process. In my own experience inside many large and small county prisons who contract with the Department of Homeland Security to hold ICE detainees, Every detained immigrant I have represented or seen has been black or brown. Black immigrants in particular are also more likely to be held in solitary confinement. Uh, while they make up 4% of people in detention, they are 24% of people in solitary confinement. And finally, if we go through the stages of enforcement, race also intersects with deportation. In 2019, DHS deported 360,000 people. 90% of these removals were from Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Deportations continue, and it's Black History Month. We've seen a lot of documentation just in this week alone of Black immigrants to Haiti, Cameroon, Congo, Angola, and other Caribbean and African countries. And this is happening despite the fact that President Biden put a 100-day pause on removals and also sought to restore prosecutorial discretion. Just this past week, we've seen 72 people deported to Haiti, including a two-month-old baby and 21 other children. Several organizations have made several legal and policy demands to the administration to focus more on the plight of Black immigrants, to include, for example, a task force at the White House for Black immigrants, to redesignate or designate certain nationals for a remedy called temporary protected status, and to consider asylum requests. So how do we move forward? Um, I, I want to first acknowledge the burden and weight of having to move forward, right? Especially for those who come from affected communities or are representing the same. The backdrop is kind of like the Doris Lessing quote, right? The conditions are still pretty extraordinary. We're living in a time of great division and hate, needless deaths of Blacks and threats to our democracy, all during a global pandemic, which has its own significant racial disparities. There is a particular vulnerability that comes from doing this work. I reflect on it every day, being a immigration lawyer and a person of color at a predominantly white institution in central Pennsylvania, home of many homegrown and national hate and white supremacist groups. And it's against this backdrop, right, that law students and lawyers have a special role. We can choose the words we use and the sources we use in a brief, in the classroom and on the street, we can educate and zealously represent our clients while centering communities. We can study the law with greater consciousness, appreciate the intersectionality and use the tool or law as a tool for change as many people before us have. So with that, I'm gonna end my remarks and I'm really looking forward to your questions. 
Thank you so much, Professor. That was incredibly expansive and insightful. I really appreciate you taking the time to come here today. So I'm uh, going to open up the question portion of our uh, presentation today. If anybody, you could please use the um, hand raising function, or again, you can put your questions in the chat. Uh, and I'll just be moderating there to open it up. But I do have a question of my own just to get things started. Um, you spoke about the importance of terminology and how the Biden administration has recognized the power of the words we use with their proposal to remove the word alien. But I think it's also important to recognize how the United States has become masters of speaking in coded language for racially charged um, uh, words. <laughs> and and a lot, one of the big ways that that comes out is with this notion of the good immigrant versus the bad immigrant. You mentioned the connection between the word alien and illegal immigrants. Um, and I think that, you know, as lawyers, legal educators, future lawyers, um, there is a, a tendency to maybe play into this narrative to make small wins for your clients, but that it potentially does a greater harm uh, in the end. And I'm just wondering, you know, what do you think are, are like the ramic ramifications of this good bad narrative and uh, what should we be demanding instead or how do we change this facially neutral language to really bring out of the shadows what's going on. So it's, it's a great question and it feeds right into the conversation about terminology, um, because we might in fact identify who gets categorized as the bad immigrant. Um, to be the person who's excluded, who's marginalized, who's at the bottom. Um, and in my experience, much of the who is the bad immigrant, you know, ends up being somebody who has a criminal history, for example, um, or has not contributed in some very visible way. Um, and I think that, you know, one way um, and this is where I'm pulling out my love for discretion when used correctly, um, to really bridge that gap is to really think of the whole person in making choices, right? Each and every day, the government has the choice about who it's going to target. And each and every day, it can make the choice to rely on a person's equities or shared humanity as opposed to a criminal history to protect them. Um, so I think that's a sort of day-to-day -day change. You know, in terms of changing hearts and minds, I, I think that's, I don't have a great answer for it. I, I think it's, I will tell you, when I moved from practicing immigration law and, you know, primarily all of my clients who were in deportation proceedings had criminal histories, right? And so they were sort of my, zealous um, advocacy towards. And then I moved to the National Immigration Forum, right, where it is very important who we choose as our messenger, right? I couldn't be the one to talk about 9-11 roundups, nor could my client be the poster child to talk about comprehensive immigration reform. And it was very unsettling, right, because it created this sort of uh, political calculus that had to be made to push immigration forward against, wait a minute, these individuals and families that I represent have, you know, real humanity and reasons to be here. Why aren't they the ones um, voicing uh, for reform or part of reform? I do think things have changed though. If you were to tell me where is the needle on the good immigrant, bad immigrant conversation today, compared to 20 years ago, I do think we've moved forward. And I think if we go way back into history, we'll actually see that, and, and you, you saw me quote Cesar um, Garcia Hernandez, but I found this even in my own research around discretion, criminality was really irrelevant um, many moons ago to whether someone should be treated favorably as a matter of discretion. Um, so I think there's actually history there that can also help us. On that note, 
I'll, I'll just keep talking until we have some volunteers. Um, you mentioned that you are studying the history of civil disobedience in the Chinese exclusion era. And I'd love to know some of those lessons that you mentioned that maybe we could apply today if, if you saw any. Yeah, so I, I still have a lot more research to do on the civil disobedience front. Um, I'm still trying, I am like down all kinds of rabbit holes because I'm trying to uncover you know, illegible congressional history from the 19th century to really understand, you know, how is it that the Supreme Court, you know, first, as an act of civil disobedience, you know, these plaintiffs go in with sophisticated lawyers to challenge the act, the registration requirements of the Geary Act, um, which extended Chinese exclusion for 10 more years. Um, and, the vast majority of Chinese residents in the United States refuse to register. They go into court, they lose, right? So the conclusion drawn is that it's constitutionally permissible, I'm, I'm simplifying here, to deport people um, as well as exclude them. But then what happened afterwards is that the Secretary of Treasury was like, we don't have money to deport all these Chinese, right? So, you know, we didn't know that all these people in an act of civil disobedience were gonna just refuse to register. And now we don't have the funds to deport them. Um, and it's such a, you know, I'm almost, I almost feel guilty that I haven't talked more about this story um, in talking about the history of prosecutorial discretion. In a way, it's a prequel to my book um, because so much of, you know, how prosecutorial discretion is designed in immigration is based both on equities, but also limited resources, right? The idea that the government simply doesn't have sufficient resources to deport the entire undocumented population. So I think there will be a lot of intersectionality with race, civil disobedience, and classical prosecutorial discretion once I make um, more headway in this project. <laughs> Uh, Professor Desai. Thank you, Julia, for moderating. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Badia, for your just terrific presentation. It's so needed right now. So what we're seeing a lot of in our clinic that initially surprised me, but it shouldn't have this semester, is people are just so incredibly afraid, low-wage immigrant workers, so incredibly afraid of immigration enforcement, so much so that they won't even participate in Zooms because they're thinking facial recognition technology. I mean, there's all kinds of things. Um, and I then started to wonder if some of this has to do with the fact that in Arizona, like Texas's attorney general, has filed a lawsuit against the federal government with respect to the deportation freeze. So I wanted to ask you if you have looked at all at those lawsuits. I have not looked at them closely, but wh whether or not you think there's merit to them, what are the implications for federalism in this battle that's playing out now, um, and, and you know, whether or not preemption doctrine is going to prevail in this case? Well, thanks for that question and for your note too. Uh, so the lawsuit that uh, Professor Desai is referring to um, was brought in Texas, arguably to a specific judge, um, challenging one portion of a memorandum published by the Department of Homeland Security a couple of weeks ago around enforcement discretion. And among many things in that memorandum is a temporary pause on removals from the United States. Uh, so that was the, that section of the memorandum that was enjoined by Texas. Uh, my reaction is, you know, I, I think the decision is legally flawed um, and, you know, includes a lot of misstatements of law, um, but perhaps, you know, more practically important right now, um, I don't think it's relevant to any kind of discretionary authority the Department of Homeland Security has to stop someone's deportation. Why? Because it is classical prosecutorial discretion 
that it applies at every stage of immigration enforcement, including but not limited to after deportation and that point of whether to execute the removal order. And that exists with or without the TRO. So in that sense, I see the TRO as a distraction. Um, what do I think it means for preemption? Well, I should turn that to the preemption scholars who are on here um, or off. Um, I, you know, I, I think this is fundamentally a federal question. So um, do I, so I, I don't know that um, the fact that we are in a more fluid space around federalism um, changes that calculus for me. But I say that not as a preemption scholar. Professor Lee. Um, thank you. Well, thanks so much, Professor Radia, for that talk and just for this discussion. I guess my question um, is a short, short one. And I just was wondering, in light of, you know, we've seen several executive orders come come down and a lot of them, you know, as as you discussed, reverse really harmful policies. But I was just wondering, um, in terms of other orders in the future, if you could, you know, dream up or write or or take additional or see, you know, President Biden take additional action, what else do you think he can do in that space that that we have yet to see as of now? Uh, so, uh, great question. Great to see you, Professor Lee. And I, if I were immigration czar, right, these are all the things I would want to change. So, I might take a step back and first say, you know, I think proclamations and executive orders are appropriate or perhaps more appropriate tools right now for the purpose of undoing, um, especially undoing severe harm that was created through those tools. But just as a general matter, I don't necessarily think that executive orders are the best tools for action from the executive branch. Um, so, you know, my, my preference actually might be rulemaking, right? And I've made that argument in other spaces where there's public notice and comment, where there's greater transparency, where there's a deliberative process. Right, you lose a lot of that if it's just a library of executive orders and proclamations. And I remember, you know, one person I interviewed for Band was a former head of the immigration agency over many decades, and his deepest criticism was on the use of executive orders as a normative matter. Right, um, they're kind of a new way of policy making, and it, they're not a better way. Is the way that he phrased it. You know, just on substance, we're certainly seeing that, you know, I think more could be around done around DACA. You know, right now we have, again, better terminology. Instead of calling DACA recipients illegal aliens, we are fortifying and preserving DACA, right? Those are affirmative terms. Um, but there's certainly a need to extend protection to younger would-be DACA requesters as well as the parents of DACA recipients. Um, and professors, uh, Professor Olivas um, and Legomsky and I wrote a letter, you know, years ago during the Obama administration to the White House, you know, explaining why they have sound prosecutorial discretion to protect parents of DACA recipients. So I think they're a really important population. I guess the other thing I would say is, as we think about legislative reform, and we see these articles in Politico and other places that, oh, maybe the Texas lawsuit for, you know, the Texas lawsuit in DACA will provide ammunition for Congress to do something around the DREAM Act. You know, my, my, what I find deeply troubling about these conversations is that preserving and sustaining a strong DACA policy has never been an either or to legislation, right? Like you can do both. You can walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, and I'd really like to see, you know, more policy making um, that falls within humane immigration policy as the president likes to say, as well as strong support for legislation. 
Uh, and then maybe I'll say finally, you know, we're certainly seeing the, the conundrum that even people who are covered under the Muslim and Africa ban are under because of other bans, right? So for example, we have a non-immigrant and immigrant proclamation issued last spring in the name of COVID-19. They haven't been repealed. They're set to expire. We have litigation challenging that. We have thousands of diversity lottery winners who are about to have visas that expire and lose their chance to be admitted into the United States as a green card holder because of the fiscal nature of the diversity lottery program. Um, so there's still continuing harm that I'd like to see addressed. And I am sensitive to the greater political complication of getting rid of a policy, whether it was done in good faith or not, that is created in the name of COVID-19. Because we are in the middle of a public health crisis um, and those ca calculations just become harder. So we also have a comment in the chat from Professor Marcus who said, I think that storytelling is always important when it comes to humanizing immigrants with criminal records. The media was doing an excellent job of this post 96 restrictive laws when 9-11 hit and delivered us a huge setback. And I, I have a, a personal question that piggybacks off of that comment a little bit. And since we have seen the media drastically shift since that time period, um, I'm, I, I'm wondering, what do you think of how the media is doing with this storytelling and this moment in time, and how could we do better? Oof, well, we're we're in a, I feel like we're in a really challenging space when it comes to media, and I think part of it has to do with all the airtime that restrictionist groups receive, and it it leaves the impression that they're larger than they really. Um, so it's not as if restrictionist groups weren't around 20, 30 years ago, um, but because of the last four years, um, in part, uh, we're seeing, you know, a normalization of, you know, the well-informed immigration scholar debating a white supremacist, right? So, so I, I don't think that's helping. Um, I 100% agree that storytelling is in fact like one of the golden solutions, right? It continues to be. Um, and we even saw this with how prosecutorial discretion was used in the past, right? Where there were highly sympathetic cases um, whose equities were brought at the forefront um, and it made people rethink uh, and revisit. Um, maybe, but I haven't done the research, uh, the shift to homeland security has also not helped, right? Because all of a sudden we had all of immigration functions in a national security agency and the message really being sent to everyone from those who are seeking naturalization, right? To those who truly were, um, I, I don't want to get into what is serious and what is not serious, right? Because that's good versus bad. You know, we're all being um, put into the same bucket and basket. So I actually think the creation of a Department of Homeland Security has, has sort of reimagined how people think about immigration and immigrants. And that too is going to be hard to to shift. And we have a question in the chat from Professor Lawrence who asked, in Britain and many European countries, pending asylum seekers are prohibited from working generally and must exist on modest benefits in government housing. Here, most pending claimants can qualify to work after a period of time. Which system is fairer and why? Yeah, thank you for the question, Professor Lawrence. Um, I mean, my my own opinion, but this is this is based on my lived experience and the fact that I believe that people who are here in the United States and who are legally eligible to apply for asylum protection 
um, also have the right to have food on the table, right? So um, it's actually a, a very long wait that exists in law today um, for someone to receive work authorization as an asylum seeker. Um, and there's also an asylum work authorization clock that starts and stops. So the time period we see in the law is in fact much shorter um, than in reality, oftentimes. Uh, and I, I, I think that the thought process, at least in changing the system from being able to apply for work authorization and asylum together to having a gap in between um, was concerns about fraud, but we haven't really seen that realized. Um, and the final thing I'll say is that the benefits that asylum seekers get here are don't appear from reading your chat, not, not my own research, to match. Um, there's no housing that is available to, to asylum seekers. Um, there's actually no benefit. In fact, that's a separate conversation, like the incongruency between refugees who are admitted into the United States and the benefits they receive and asylum seekers and those who are granted asylum as asylees. I apologize in if I mispronounce your name, but Professor Balwarte. That's great. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, Professor Wadia, for, for really everything you do. Um, you're so phenomenal, and we all appreciate you so much. Um, I, I had a question. So like you, when I teach immigration law, I teach a lot about race and racism, um, starting with Chinese exclusion, of course, and, and the Muslim ban, and Arizona talk a lot about and anti-Latino um, uh, sentiments. Um, I, I actually, I was reflecting at the end of this semester where I made a particular effort to raise um, questions of systemic racism throughout the semester. And I was reflecting on the fact that I didn't have a lot of really good material on anti-Black racism. And, and that's very much uh, a, a consideration and concern. And, and I do a lot of work with, with um, Haitian migrants. And, and I just, I, I you know, I apologize if this is out of the blue, but I'm just wondering if you have successfully incorporated that into your own teaching on immigration, if you have suggestions for particularly effective ways of raising that um, when, when we teach the doctrine. Well, I, I'm, that's a big question and I'm learning myself. You know, I, I have a very diverse classroom as I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, and my weapon has always been the immigration statute, right? So I actually have a history of a pretty nerdy code-based um, way of teaching immigration. And I still do that. Um, you know, now that I've given this talk, I'll try to incorporate some of it um, in, in, in class too. Um, I will say with Chinese exclusion, and, it's nothing groundbreaking, but I really love starting with part of the documentary from PBS. And I don't know if you use the Chinese Exclusion Act. It's a, there's a 35 minute segment for educators. Um, and it just, it gives you a flavor with visuals and historians talking. And it, I think it really sets the stage about like, this is the founding of our immigration law, right? Um, and so um, it's not you saying our laws are racist, right? But like, you know, it's, it's, it's so apparent and you're not the one saying it. And I actually find that useful because then it generates a conversation. Um, with Haitians, and I've been thinking about this too because I haven't incorporated a lot in the survey class, you know, with the drumbeat of, immigration enforcement against Haitians, Haitian families. I mean, Haitians are the largest population in family detention right now. Um, and I'm at, in a state that's one of the three family detention centers in the country is, is a few hours from me. You know, so how do you tie that to just historically how Haitians have been treated? 
Um, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting historical work you could do with then the litigation, protective measures by Congress, and then what is happening to Haitians now. They're also very active, right? Like the inter the, the folding of um, advocacy by Haitian communities um, into the immigrant rights movement. You know, to me, I'm seeing that in a in a more dramatic way. Um, so that might also be a, a space to look into. Yeah, So actually in preparation for this talk too, I, I read an article um, from Professor Doss who you mentioned in, in your talk and she did talk a little bit about um, anti-blackness and in migration laws, early migration laws separate from immigration laws and how um, a lot, there was a tie to Haiti in that time period because there was the fear that what happened there with the revolution um, may repeat itself here in the United States. And I thought that was a really interesting parallel that she drew that um, one of the reasons when, when uh, free black people were uh, required to carry papers and um, there's a tie there, I guess, I think between the Chinese Exclusion Act. And you mentioned in your talk that the Chinese exclusion era served as a bridge to the Jim Crow era. And I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit more. Yeah, so um, I was really trying to identify points in history, right? Like what was happening in US history at the time that exclusionary laws were taking place. Um, and then the papers requirement too, um, we also saw um, distinctions being made between immigrants of color and Chinese in particular um, and everybody else. Um, you know, have I done a deep dive into Jim Crow and Chinese exclusion? You know, not so much, but I think it is um, significant if you look at the timing in which we saw racialized laws and immigration and what was happening in the United States at that time. Well, we are almost out of time. So I guess as a, a one last question, um, I was wondering about your opinion on the Biden administration's the 2021 Citizenship Act that they've proposed and what do you think it got right and how do you think it could be improved? Well, a big question to end on, right? So we haven't seen the bill text. It, um, it's rumored to be out next week. Um, so we should be on the lookout for it. So I've seen the same fact sheet as everyone else. Um, I will say that before I came to Penn State, I have been through many cycles of comprehensive immigration reform. Um, so I have a, a good idea of like what all the parts of this bill look like and where the trade-offs were made and who's gonna be upset and why. Um, but some of, the, some of the things that the bill appears to have gotten right, um, first, the, the change in terminology is a game changer, right? We haven't seen that in any other comprehensive bill. Um, one significant change is repealing the three and 10 year bar. Right, it sounds like the sort of numerical, wonderful, right? Um, but it's such a barrier to so many people who are in legally qualifying relationships who are barred from being in the United States um, for no other reason than what is truly a technicality. So I just think that that is a very good move. Again, it's not dissimilar from the arguments we were trying to make with the Muslim ban. These are people in legally eligible and qualifying relationships under the law, right? Um, so um, uh, that I think is a big change. You know, providing expedited green cards to populations like those with DACA, deferred enforced departure and TPS, and then thinking ahead for what a path to green card and citizenship looks like for the 11 million you know, those are all good moves. I'd love to see what will happen with people coming in the future. Um, and um, I also would give a cautionary note because I don't know that this is great 
politically for the administration, um, you know, I think we need a, a, a huge and significant legislation. We haven't had an immigration statutory change of significance in decades. Um, but I am not persuaded that 11 million people are going to get green cards, right? Um, because there are going to be disqualifications. There are going to be ineligibilities. There are going to be people who fall through the cracks. There are going to be people who are afraid to apply because they live in an area where there are no immigration lawyers or they don't even know about the bill. Um, so I, I just feel like I'm not sure, but I'm not a communications expert, um, whether that messaging, you know, should be softened a little. Um, but, I, but I certainly support the spirit of it. Now, you know, what else would I like to see or where might it fall short? You know, there are a lot of changes to, you know, I'd love to see a codification of ending family detention. I mean, that can be done as a matter of discretion um, by the executive branch. Um, but given what we've seen by terms of harm, you know, ending it for good um, is good policy, right? Two-year-olds are not a national security threat. 96% of asylum seeking families show up in court. So I think there are just a lot of different arguments for why it should end. Um, and finally, I would just talk about asylum reform. You know, we don't know what all of that might look like legislatively, um, but those are also rules that I think are in high need of reform. You know, we have a rule from 1996 where you have to apply for asylum within a year of your last arrival to the United States or you're barred, right? And this one year, I mean, even the person who hatched the idea, no pun intended, or maybe it is, was Senator Orrin Hatch, right? He was the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And he said, you know, when supporting the one-year filing deadline, that his goal was not to turn away genuine refugees, right? Um, but And that he would revisit the bar if necessary. And I think it's time to do that because there are individuals who are uh, genuinely refugees under our refugee definition who are blocked from asylum for no other reason than um, a calendar date. Um, so that's just another example, which I think would be best repealed legislatively. Thank you. And we do have one last question in the chat. Uh, it says, do you think hate crimes will increase due to the frustration of white supremacists in the near future? So, I, I mean, I haven't done the tabulation, but I think we're already there, right? We've certainly seen an increase in, in hate crimes or even bullying, right? Like if you look at K through 12 schools, if you look at the you know, kids who are Muslim and look Muslim are bullied at a far higher rate right now um, than 20 years ago. Um, but I, I, I do think, you know, we've also seen an increase in hate crimes against Asians because of COVID-19 and sort of the perpetuation by the former administration that it was a Chinese virus, for example. Um, you know, I think, your question is an important one, and it may exist, you know, with or without immigration reform, right? Um, because I think this is where we look at the conditions of our world and our country. Um, and I think there are a lot of sources for what might be um, surfacing hate. That's a very sad note to end on, though. So somebody can somebody can ask me a more uplifting question that has a more uplifting answer. Well, we will we will invite people who need to go because it's exactly 115 to to log off without uh, with impunity without penalty. Um, and and if if you're willing to stay and talk more, we're certainly willing to to host it. It's totally up to oh. your time too. I I have a, a I have like 10 15 minutes if that if if anyone has questions. And but if this was your lunch, you may also want to go get lunch. So I support that too. Um, it's been a wonderful and wide ranging talk. 
And boy, I hope you're able, I, I bet you're able to use some of this work that you've been putting together and materials that you've been assembling for us because um, I know I know so much of the country is is hungry for this kind of discussion. So we're really, really grateful. Thank you so much for this excellent presentation and discussion, Professor Wadia. Sure, thank you for having me.